We're going to be talking this later, but we're also going to be discussing this morning's top news stories with Camilla Tomini and Nick Ferrari. He's, is, he, is, he still, he's, is he still on the radio? He's still on the radio still. He'll be joining us uh, imminently. Uh, if you want to get involved in the conversation, we'd love you to send us in a message by WhatsApp. You can scan the QR code uh, that's just going to pop up on the screen right there. You can get in touch using X, Facebook or our This Morning app. You must be 18 or over and Nicholas is, is in place. There You're right, is. as if by magic. Morning, Nick. Hello, guys. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Good, Good to see you, Nick. Good to see you. Uh, right, let's yeah. start then, Camilla, if you can, with the extraordinary pictures we've had from Dubai. This flooding. Crazy. A, a year's so worth of rain in 12 hours. It's so bizarre to see this imagery because obviously we associate Dubai with, you know, all round sunshine every day of the year. Um, really odd because of the theorising behind it. Um, I'm no weather expert, but there's mm -hmm. been this suggestion that it's as a result of cloud seeding. Mm -hmm. Had you heard of cloud seeding? I hadn't, and then I looked it up, and it's something to do with adding salt to clouds yes. via drones. It's very spooky. I mean, my brother lived in Dubai, and I've been in Dubai when they've cloud seeded. Have oh, you? Yeah, What's yeah, it yeah. like? Uh, well, it's, it's an extraordinary thing because uh, we were there not long after lockdown, and we were there over New Year, and there was a suggestion that. They, wanted pe they didn't want people to gather together in public places because they were trying to control the virus. And there was a suggestion that they were cloud seeding to make sure it was raining so people stayed inside, stayed in their apartments okay. rather than gathering on beaches. One way of doing it, isn't it? Uh, so it's, it it's, I mean, it's a well-known thing that they have done and they've done to sort of great effect in the past. But there's a debate going on as to whether they've actually done it. So I think planes were spotted in the sky before the heavens opened mm -hmm. and that's raised suspicions that they have done this cloud seeding. I think the authorities in Dubai are trying to kind of push back against that because obviously this has caused a degree of devastation yes. um, and therefore they don't want to look as if it's been self-perpetuated. And look at this plane landing. Imagine being... I mean, it's kind of not a scene that we would ever associate yeah, with the Middle of, East. you've heard of aquaplaning, but that's slightly different, isn't this it? This is something completely different. So, um, a bit of a debate going on about exactly what happened. I, too, have a brother who lived in Dubai, yeah, yeah. and obviously you spend most of your time there racing from aircon to aircon. So, the idea of wading to aircon seems odd, Nick. Yeah. It does, doesn't it? I look, the seriousness, we, we have to record the fact, sadly, that one at least one person has lost their life over there, and these are also parts of the floods that were in Oman and other parts of the region where more than 10 lives have been lost. And I just wonder whether this is a warning, because uh, I, too, I didn't really understand what cloud seeding was all about, and I also looked it up. And my only take on this would be, and like Camilla, I am no, I am no weather expert, but... We shouldn't try and play God, you know? The weather is up there for a certain reason, and whether... And I take on board why you think, Ben, they were doing it uh, with your brother or whatever, whatever. I think if you start messing around with that, we might, viewers, be seeing what some of the dire consequences can be. We have enough issues with climate change without trying to play God with the weather, and this might be a very salutary lesson. The, uh, the National Centre of Meteorology uh, has issued a statement saying that they oversees the cloud seeding operations in the UAE, saying there's no such cloud seeding operations before or during the storm, and then there's experts at Reading who work with the UAE on cloud seeding, saying that the downpours were a result of medium-sized thunderstorms uh, sparked by massive thunder clouds which had formed when mm. heat drew up moisture in the atmosphere. I've been in Dubai in the past years ago uh, with Annie for a job, and it rained. And the one thing that they aren't set up for no. is serious rain. Yeah. To be fair, Very it's so quickly, arid and dry that absolutely. if rain comes in that kind of force imminent. and that rapidly, then you're going to have floods because the ground's so hard yeah. and so dry it yes. can't absorb it. It's not much grass and the grass that is there is artificial. Yeah. OK, so that does explain it. But I kind of concur with Nick here. If there's any suggestion at all of tampering, we can appreciate why they do it, but in this case... If they have, it's back backfired spectacularly. Yes, absolutely. More investigations are needed on this, I think. Pretty sharpish. Um, OK, here's our second story. It's saying almost half of the public are willing to pay for better NHS services. Yeah, how do we break that down? Because are people saying that they want to pay more in tax or national insurance for better NHS services? Because uh, there's a debate that's always gone on, hasn't there, between uh, the rise in NHS spending, whether it's in line with inflation, whether it's actually over the course of time a cut rather than a rise, and that's set against a post-COVID backdrop of there being nearly 9 million people waiting for treatment. Yes. However, what I found interesting about recent political campaigning, you know, reform are trying to make a point that people should be incentivised to have private health because it takes them out of the NHS system. That's got... That, that's a little contradictory because people do have private health. I looked it up before we came on. 6.9 million adults in this country have private health cover. Mm. But, of course, 
they still revert to the NHS in emergencies. Sure. Yes. And often with things like cancer treatment, the NHS provides a better service at times than private. Yeah. I think what this is, this is saying, nine in ten respondents saying that the health service needs reform. Well, who could disagree with that? Particularly when we're waiting for doctors' um, appointments and some people are extracting yeah. their own teeth with pliers. But whether people have... You know, we're in a cost of living crisis, so... Are people saying that they want to put more money into what seems to be a bottomless pit? Or would they like the NHS to be completely restructured? I think, and Nick, it's a really difficult thing, this, because as soon as there's any suggestion that people might have to pay at the point of service for their NHS, people are suggesting, well, the government's trying to privatise the NHS and they've been desperate to do this for years. It's a political hot potato, as they call it. But the idea from this poll, the suggestion that there is a groundswell of support from the public to say they understand the opportunity to pay some money might alleviate some of that pressure, might allow them to get a service uh, that would sort of be uh, 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 faster than it would be if it was just reliant on, on, on sort of a free at service um, perspective, is, is quite an interesting nuance, isn't it? It is, and you mentioned the political aspect, and I'm going to be saying something now that would definitely not get me elected, which is the NHS is not working and it needs to be radically reformed. Let me explain why. It was just last month that a poll came out and showed the lowest satisfaction level with, yeah. been, with patients with the NHS for more than 40 years since records began. So it's not working for us, patients. In the same month, a survey came out and showed that there are record emotional or mental health issues with the NHS staff as well. So it's not working for them. So it's not working for the patients, it's not working for the NHS. Something has got to give. The poll that was in Camilla's title today, actually in the Daily Telegraph today, underscores that. And personally, and I'm interested to see what you think, I would have no issue at all with being able to ring my surgery today and saying, can I come in Tuesday afternoon and here's £20, here's £25 to guarantee me a certain window. That, to me, would alleviate those people who are not able to do that. I'm in a fortunate position, I'm in paid employment, I am one of those people in the Telegraph poll who is ready to pay more, no question about it. Mm. Having said that, then you're worried about it creating more of a two-tier system and if you can't afford 25 quid to come in at a certain time, I can see why that's attractive. I am also find the idea of fining people for missing appointments quite yep. attractive and I know yep. that's been railed against because of this three at the point of use. We have to accept that when the NHS was set up in 1945, it was a very different world and a very different Britain to today, yes. not just because of population increase but also because of the generational divide that we now have with more people who are over 60 mm. than, than younger and actually population is decreasing in terms of the birth rate which means that my children's generation your children's generation are going to have to increasingly be paying for older people to receive treatment but interestingly Camilla, i think this is one of the things and i worked with dr hillary for many years next door yes of and course. one of the things nick that he used to say is the idea that the nhs is free mm. is just wrong mm. people forget that actually if you organize an appointment to go and see your gp that costs money, so when you don't go along, if they're not paying for it, they just don't turn up. That has cost the NHS money, it means someone else hasn't got there. So actually, the NHS, yes, of course, it should be free for us to use, but it does cost money, and, and trying to shift people's perception of the value that we get from the NHS is about understanding how much it costs to run. You're right, Hillary's right. I think we discussed this recently, didn't we, on your show and the millions of missed appointments. And it is something like six to seven million missed appointments per annum in this country, which I think is utterly shameful. And to Camilla's point, I know there is a danger of a two-tier service. I understand that. This would have to be very carefully introduced. But for someone like me, I think if you get something for free, you don't necessarily value it, so you don't turn up. And as we said at the time when we discussed this last time, but you're not able to do that with some hairdressers, they're going to charge you. You can't yeah. do it with some restaurants if you yeah. don't turn up. It is just rank rudeness yes. to treat doctors and nurses in this fashion. Absolutely. Uh, let's bring you a royal story. He quit the UK, Camilla, four years ago uh, to go to the States, Prince Harry, but now it's finally official. He has assigned the paperwork to say that the US is his home. Yeah. Do you know what? I was going to ask Kat about mm -hmm. this as yeah. somebody who's been sort of Anglo-American. Yep. I don't think this is much of a surprise. I mean, he's putting his place of residence as the US. No. Of course he is. He's lived in Montecito now since they left the UK, which is 2020. I mean, they've been there four years. They've had two children, admittedly Archie born here, Lilibet born yes. there. We've had this whole question about citizenship. When Meghan came to the UK um, and was still in the royal family in an official sense, there was a chat about her being a dual citizen and all the rest of it. She didn't proceed with that. There's a chat about whether he's going to become a US citizen. I mean, what, what's the, the deal, Kat, with 
having this kind of dual... It essentially is how many days you spend on soil. So it, I know it's been written up that he announced the day as the day he left Frogmore Cottage. Yes. But that's probably because his feet touched American soil that day after getting off the aeroplane. There, there's a certain set number of days that means you automatically then become a resident there. That becomes your primary mm. residence, essentially. But you still, you would still have to get a green card. I was going to say, start... residency isn't the same as a green no. card. No. Green card is the permission to permanently reside and work in America. Yes. Is exactly. it more telling than Camilla that it's just happened after four years, it's it's only just happened? That he's only Maybe. just put that down for the first time as his place of... I think it in the trade we would call this being in, given an inch and taking a mile. Ah. <laughs> I'm not sure what Nick thinks. You've you never know, done that, Nick, have you? It's, <laughs> a, it's, it's sort of a one-fact <laughs> story that's been blown into something more really symbolic. Think. Well, yes. I wonder. I mean, I've got a question for Countess Camilla. <laughs> I understood that in the King's absence, currently, Harry was allowed to be put forward to open a hospital or do whatever. Presumably now, genuinely, Camilla, I don't know, but if we now have him now with no UK residents solely living on US soil, to your point, to Caswell, he, he has to come off the deputies list, surely, or well, deputising list, sorry, deputising list. Yeah, to, to be fair, that would require a, a, a law change. So he is a councillor of state, and that... Uh, uh, that deputising role... Which means when... you need a UK address, right? Yeah, well, well, I don't know if you need a new UK address, you just need to oh. be in the line of succession. So that is why the councillors of state at, mom at the moment are Prince William, mm -hmm. Prince Harry, um, the Duke of York... It's and Princess wonderful. Beatrice, because they're the top four in the line of succession. The palace then realised they needed to bring in reinforcements, not least in light of the demise of the Duke of York. And so, in a kind of pseudo-official capacity, Prince Edward and Princess Anne can also act as councillors. Interestingly, since he was diagnosed with cancer, they haven't enacted the use of the councillors of state. They've said, actually, we don't need to do that officially. Behind the scenes, he's still doing his constitutional work, mm -hmm. he's still looking at his red boxes, he's still doing video meetings, etc. Yeah. But you make a point looking forward to the future about the appropriateness of having Harry on the list, but then you're having to dive into should he be stripped of his title, should he be taken out of the line of succession, which is a conversation for another show. Yeah. Isn't it just? We don't quite have time for that right now. <laughs> uh, but, but do stay with us. We're going to carry on discussing top stories with these guys shortly, uh, including next, the chart battle, Dwendal battles. But can Taylor Swift knock Beyonce off the top spot? We're just a day away from the Ooh, album dropping. It's exciting. Dropping. Fever pitch. That next. And he's the man who includes both billionaire and astronaut on TV. <laughs> so Richard Branson will be right here. We'll see you after this.